Good morning, everybody. So, national security. It's an interesting topic at the moment. Uh, a lot of my talks are more um, theoretical demonstrations of how we can be more aware of security and privacy. And I thought I should start eating my own dog food and start working on projects that can actually affect change. So what I want to share with you today is a, uh, a case study, a work in progress on a project that I'm working on. Uh, and what I want to try and do is enable security precautions. I do have a microphone, but I'm not sure if the speakers are on. Um, the microphone's definitely on, but it's recording for the YouTube video. I'm not sure if there's... Can, can you hear me okay? Okay. Do you want to come down the front, maybe? Okay. Is everybody else okay? Awesome. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to try and work out how can we use the, uh, the, the privacy principles and security principles that we already have in place and apply that to software as a service, which is obviously a harder place to do that because by virtue of software as a service, you need to be able to see the data as a service provider. Um, so there's this little diagram up here which describes how we think email works, but how it actually works. Uh, email is one of those things that the middle service provider doesn't necessarily need to be able to see. Um, but how can we extend encryption techniques that we already have? So let's have a look at how communication works <coughs> already, if I can get my clicker to work. So securing communications. General principles of communication. Alice wants to talk to Bob. It's quite simple. Um, so the way we do it at the moment is we have a central server. This could be, in the analog sense, the postal service, or it could be uh, Facebook, or it could be Twitter, or it could be your uh, mobile phone provider for SMSs. And all of the data that's sent between those two is pretty much insecure end-to-end. -end. As soon as Alice sends her message, it's probably not encrypted. It gets to the central server, it gets stored there until Bob requests that from the central server. It's still unencrypted. If anybody has access to the central server at this point, they've got access to the full un unencrypted data. So obviously what most people do nowadays is SSL. So we're encrypting the data from the point of Alice to the server, and then from the server to Bob. And we've reduced the unencrypted space to just on the server. But again, looking at a national security world where we don't know who has access to these servers nowadays, that access is still plain text. So the next step from there would be to encrypt the data once it hits the server. So Alice sends the message to the central server and the central server immediately encrypts it using some key that it has. And then when Bob requests it, it gets decrypted just in time before it gets sent to Bob. And then when Bob responds, it gets encrypted and gets sent back to Alice. So at this point here, we now have a much smaller overhead of unsecure space. We've got when the message is decrypted just before it's sent to the recipient or when it's encrypted just as it, ar as it arrives from the sender. Uh, but the downside here is that the keys are on the server. So if somebody gets access to this and they've got access to the data plus the code, then there's no reason they can't use the keys plus the code, the knowledge <coughs> in the code, to work out if there's any seeds or what the, the key transform is, if there is any to then decrypt those messages. So while on disk it's secure, somebody having access to the central server still has the ability to read that data. <coughs> so this is where we are nowadays. Alice will encrypt the message on her device, send it to the server. Now, theoretically, this part here is sending an encrypted message to the central server. It doesn't need to be SSL anymore. It probably will be because it's best practice nowadays. But it doesn't need to be because it's encrypted already. The central server can then store it, send it on to Bob. Bob will then decrypt that message on his device. Oops, wrong view. This way. So Alice will use Bob's public key to encrypt the message. Bob then uses his private key to decrypt it. Nobody else can decrypt it except Bob. So if it's intercepted, it's, it's useless. Bob will then use Alice's public key to encrypt the response, and Alice will use her private key to decrypt it. Who here uses Signal Messenger? Who here knows that there's a competition at the end of this talk? Uh, 
we'll, I'll be getting you all to install Signal Messenger. So Signal is an end-to-end, -end, it's a, an SMS replacement um, written by a, a company called uh, Whisper Systems in the US, and it does exactly this. So it creates uh, public-private keys for people. Uh, so it's really easy to use for people who don't want to understand how public-private key encryption works. And one of the hardest things we have nowadays uh, is the fact that encryption is hard for end users, which is why GPG for email never really took off, because it's too hard to implement. It's too hard for the end user to actually do. Uh, so there are a lot of tools coming out nowadays that make it easy for end users to encrypt without knowing that that's what they're doing. So let's move on to software as a service. We know that we've got end-to-end -end encryption now, but obviously the, middle, the, the central server at the point that it's got the encrypted message can't actually do anything with it. So how do we allow software as a service systems to manipulate data because that's the service they provide. So I've had a pet project for a while, um, which is something to help me manage my own finances. So I've got a number of bank accounts, like there might be a mortgage and my own personal spending account and a couple of others. And then I've got these categories of things that I want to uh, allocate budgets to. So I might have my spending account, which gets a certain amount of money per month from my salary. But part of that goes to just fun, going out, whatever, going for drinks with friends. Part of it will go to um, further education. I might be paying for uh, online training courses, that kind of thing. I want to be able to, to track what I'm spending without having to have a different bank account for every purpose. So I want to create this virtual world of bank accounts that have a many-to-many -many relationship to my actual bank accounts. But I don't want, first of all, I haven't found a service that provides that. Um, so as all good developers, we roll our own because it's educational, but also possibly a waste of time, but it's fun. Um, so this is what I want to build. <coughs> so let's consider Alice, who's using a software, software as a service system to, to talk to her bank. So Alice will be able to log into the system, retrieve her dashboard information back. She'll be able to pay for a subscription. She might upgrade for, to be able to manage more accounts or to have different functionality. Uh, she'll be able to view her account information from the software as a service system. And then she'll also be able to view her statement information. And then further on, probably do some kind of categorization of those statements, the line items. This was for going out. This was for rent. And meanwhile, the software as a service server will be talking to Alice's bank independently in its own time, just getting more information. So every now and then, it'll go off to the bank and say, do you have any more statement information? Then it'll download it. And then it'll process, process that using some kind of transactional rule that Alice has set up. So it might be able to detect based on a line item that this is for utility bills. So at the moment, all that data there is unencrypted. So if I had access to that server, I would be able to see all of the accounts that Alice has, all of the categories that she's defined, what she spends on what, and where her money goes. I don't want that for me. Also, the likelihood is that she's going to be linking this to all her other banks. So some people might say, well, you know, the bank already has all this information. But if you've got bank accounts with three different bank providers, that's separating the knowledge of where your money goes across three different institutions. This software as a service system in the middle now actually has knowledge of far more than each individual bank. So that data is now even more valuable. So I want to implement some kind of zero knowledge. Zero knowledge is a bit of a strange word. Some people use it different ways. So my definition of zero knowledge, and the one I'll explain to you, is basically the ability to prove that you know a truth without sharing the truth. So imagine you have a corridor, which is the loop, and you know that there's a corridor with a loop, and you know that at the end of that corridor is a door, and that door is locked with some kind of test. And you get this green and this red carry to come along, and green wants to prove to red that green knows the answer to the test without telling red what the test is. So red knows that if green goes round one side of the corridor and then comes back the other side of the corridor, that green knows the truth. But red still doesn't know the truth. So what I want to do through zero knowledge is to have a transaction server that knows the truth about all the transactions and a profile server that knows the truth about all the profiles without each other knowing the truth. So the transaction server will know, here's a list of statements and transactions, but I don't know whose they are. And the profile server will know, here's Alice and here's Bob, but I don't know what their transactions are. So that's the problem that I'm trying to solve. 
So the transaction server, and the transaction server there has two lines and a sequence diagram that represents time, and I want to identify that those two timelines could be totally separate. So on its own schedule, the transaction server can continue going off to Alice's banks and getting the data back, encrypt that data on arrival with a public key for the, the bank account. Meanwhile, Alice can still log in. The profile server will load Alice's user profile. It'll then take just the profile plan identifier and send that off to the transaction server. This allows the transaction server to return a token saying anybody using this token has access to these capabilities. You can have up to 10 accounts, for example, or you're able to categorize things up to 50 different categories. So if you wanted different levels of subscription in the system, you could define the capabilities through that token without the transaction server needing to know that this is Alice. All they need to know is whoever uses this token has the capabilities of using these features. That then gets returned back to Alice, uh, including a private key, and yes, that's stored on the profile server. I'll cover that in a second. Alice is then able to decrypt her own user profile because part of the user profile is encrypted on here because we don't want the user, the profile server to know anything about the transactions. Decrypts that information and then can, can then use the token plus account details to view the statement from the transaction server. So at this point, the transaction server is being asked for information about transactions without knowing that it's Alice making them. Is that making sense? Alice can then decrypt the data on her device. So we're encrypting data on arrival and we're decrypting it only in Alice's system. So there is a point there where the data is returned from the bank at which it's unencrypted, but it could potentially be anonymous. If the bank has an API that allows you to uh, create some kind of OAuth mechanism, then it could potentially be a pseudo-anonymous connection. If, it requires the, if the bank requires you to provide account details to log in, then obviously that's not anonymous anymore because anybody looking at the transaction server can then see the account number. Um, but hopefully, the bank has a system in place that allows you to uh, retrieve information without the authentication mechanism identifying the owner of the account. That'd be nice. But of course, that's totally up to the bank. <coughs> so, profile encryption. I was going through that with the profile being stored on the profile server and then Alice decrypting it. Let's have a quick look into that. So, the user account, for any standard system, you'd have a subscription plan uh, and an account password. So, the account password is used to identify the user and that is provided by Alice when she logs in as her account password. Meanwhile, inside, there's a lump of data which is encrypted on the profile server, which contains transaction information, and that's references to the accounts that belong to Alice. And that's unlocked using the profile password. So just looking at a class diagram view of that, we've got username and password, fairly standard type user table. Uh, subscription plan, that's fine. We store the profile information in an encrypted form in the profile data. And that will basically be a map to the accounts that Alice has access to. So it's encrypted so that if somebody looks at the profile server, they can't see the account numbers. So how do we get that out if the private key is also on the profile server without the profile server itself being able to decrypt it? So the theory here is, if Alice provides a profile password to the browser, the browser actually hashes it before sending it to the accounts at the profile server. So it's been hashed once. The profile server receives the hash, which it believes is Alice's password, not a hash password. So it treats that as the pas password. So the profile server never actually receives Alice's real password, only a hashed version. It will then hash it again, because that's what we do to check that the password is valid, and retrieve her account details and return them. The browser already knows Alice's password because she's provided it during the login mechanism. So the browser can now decrypt the encrypted data using her profile password as a key. So theoretically, at this point here within the profile, ser uh, the, yeah, the profile server, the account data is encrypted, but cannot be decrypted because the profile server doesn't know the real password. It only knows a hashed version of the password. Does that make sense? Stop me at any time if you have questions. Meanwhile, there's an account public key which is stored on the transaction server. So when the data is uh, encrypted at this point, it uses a public key. And there's a corresponding private key on this side which is stored in the, uh, the encrypted account information that's on the profile server. 
So when the profile server res returns all the data back to Alice's browser, the browser can decrypt it, work out which accounts they have access to, and that'll include the private keys. So the private keys are encrypted, but stored on the profile server. There's a lot of trust on the encryption working and not being reversible on the profile server. But I think I'm doing all right. Perhaps there's a key pair a generator. Because it can't be generated from the profile server because then it would have to know the real yeah. So the question is where is the key pair created? The key pair created can only ever be created on the browser because the browser is the only device that's under Alice's control. If it's created on the profile server, then the profile server technically has it at least in memory for a short period of time. But we can't trust that the profile server hasn't already been compromised and somebody's monitoring the memory data. So it's created in the, in the browser. Yeah. Um, so what's missing from this diagram? How are we gonna process the data once it's encrypted? So there's a number of different ways that you can process encrypted data. There's a process called homomorphic encryption, which allows you to perform <coughs> simplistic operations on encrypted data. So you provide encrypted data and a transform, and the result is the encrypted version of the result, even though the transform doesn't actually know what the original data is. I don't actually understand how that works. It's kind of like magic. Um, but the downside at the moment is it's restricted to simple operations. Uh, you can take integers and add them together or increment them. Um, taking a string and analyzing whether the word rent exists in there is not something you can do with homomorphic encryption at the moment. Um, so <coughs> at the moment what I'm planning to do is uh, you get the statement information in. Um, we want to be able to categorize it into whichever category you want. Um, but we're going to be encrypting the data, which means you can't. In fact, I want to encrypt all the data so that if you look at the transaction server, it's completely messed up. Um, I'll probably step back from that in the future because there's going to be some information that's not sensitive that can actually be processed in real time by the transaction server. Um, but I prefer to encrypt everything first and then step back as required based on a proof of concept that it's actually a sane thing to do rather than assume up front that you only need to encrypt certain items. Um, and I'll mention a bit why about why later. Um, so at the moment I'm settling for client-side processing which means that you have to be logged in at the time for anything to happen, but there are ways around that as well. So essentially what's gonna happen is that Alice will get processing rules from the profile server and then go to the transaction server and say, give me any, uh, any transactions that have, haven't been processed yet. Alice's browser will then decrypt that information, process that information, re-encrypt that information and send it back to the transaction server, marked as processed. So in the future, <coughs> she's, she's basically a cron job processing the data in the browser. So we might get transaction information like this, where the description is completely encrypted, and it's got a category ID, which maps to a category name. Whereas if it was processed on the server, we wouldn't be able to get that level of information. So, time for the demo. So I've, my, my goal with this is to try and create a, um, uh, either a, a, a plugin or a, a technical process to be able to apply this to multiple systems, not just my financial system. Um, I don't know yet whether it's going to be more like an RFC, a set of guidelines that can be implemented, or whether it'll eventuate as packages that you can use. I'm using Laravel at the moment, just for the back end, for both the transaction and the profile servers. Um, they're completely separate installations. They're running on different domains. Um, but what I'll show you first is uh, so basically I, I, for the transaction uh, for the profile server, I grabbed uh, a standard Laravel install and I used MakeAll. Who's familiar with MakeAll on Laravel? Okay, so for those without your hands up, if you install Laravel and you do artisan make all, pretty much out of the box, you've got a website now that allows you to register, provide a username, password, email address, and log in. So you don't have to do any work. You've already got a system where you can log in, log out, and you've got a user profile. So I wanted to start from a very basic level of what's easiest to implement and then build on top of that. So I've started with uh, make auth and if I can remember my key keyboard shortcuts, uh, I then created a JavaScript file called profile.js. So this is the profile 
JavaScript that runs on the browser in order to perform all the operations that I've just been describing. So let's have a quick look through it. So <coughs> we have a login hook, and basically this looks for the login form and the register form, and it creates a couple of extra elements. Now when I show you the demo, they're visible, but theoretically they'd be hidden from view. And what this does is that when you submit a login <coughs> or a registration form uh, on submit up here, it'll take the password out of the DOM and the email address out of the DOM. It uses the email address to create a seed. It then uses that seed to decrypt the password. So it creates a hash of it. And then into the decrypt DOM object, it'll then put the value of that hash password. So that's on login. On registration, because there's two password elements, the password and repeat password, it does that twice. Um, but you'll see that in the demo because I've actually made those uh, fields visible. So this is the point that uh, the passwords are hashed in the browser before they're sent to the profile server. Now in the view itself, in Laravel, I've taken out the name attributes of the password fields, so they are never actually sent to the server. So the only thing that'll ever be sent is the username, email address, and the hashed passwords. We then have an initialization system. Uh, it'll make a call to API user. This is also out of the box from Laravel, and it gives you a JSON response of the user information. And that'll, that'll include everything that the user has in it. So if you remember back to the class diagram, that's the uh, username, email address. The password's actually not re returned, but it will return the public private keys and the encrypted data of the profile. So we use that in order to work out what stage the user is at. So if you've just created your account, those values are going to be null. So then we check the public key. If the public key is blank, we basically use this async create key pair, which is another method that I've written down at the bottom that I don't have time to go through, but if you want to see that in more detail, I can show you. Basically, I'm, I'm using OpenPGPJS, which is a J JavaScript information implementation of OpenPGP. Um, we create a, a new key pair based on the password that was provided at the time of they logged in, or at the time of they registered. Assuming that all goes well, we then check the private data. So the public private key has just been created, but do we have any data yet? So it'll pull out the user data profile data. If that's blank, then it'll ask you for another password for your transaction data. So Alice is going to have to create an account to log into the profile system. But then to decrypt her actual transaction information requires a second password because we don't want that to be the same. Technically, you could, but it probably wouldn't be a wise idea. I'm still trying to work that one out. Um, so then we basically create a, an account reference, which is a blank array because she doesn't have any accounts yet. And we get the private key and the public key from the transaction key that we just created. And we save that to the API user, so we post that information back in. So now the profile data is complete. So the user now has public private key and default profile data. And meanwhile, the projectors decided that my laptop is no longer there. There we are. Um, and then right at the very end, we just have a start app. So we require OpenPGP uh, and we decrypt the information out of the, uh, the user object that's being provided. And we start from there. So, demo time. Right. To save me going into MySQL and showing the actual data, I've created a couple of helper screens here. So we've got the data that's stored on the profile server here. Currently all we have is a subscription, which is a free, free subscription. They have up to 10 accounts. It's also the default one. So when a new user account is created, we'll select that one. We have no users. And we have the data on the transaction server. We have no users, we have no accounts, and we have no tokens. So let's start from the beginning. We have here the register page. So if you're familiar with the make auth or, or generic quick start Laravel apps or probably most framework apps nowadays, name, email address, password, password, command of the box, here are the extra two 
fields that I put at the bottom, they would be hidden in the actual application. Um, but password and confirm password are both void of any name element. So that data will be sent to the server. So let's create an account. Nice and secure. Now, when I click register, you'll see the bcrypt and confirm bcrypt fields complete momentarily. The others were also cleared. Now, technically, you don't need to do that because it's not being submitted anyway, but the JavaScript will clear it just in case. Uh, and the account, as you can see, I'm logged in, top right-hand corner there, got my username. Um, now, remember when we looked through it and it said if there's no account transaction data, then create a new key and ask for a password. This is the prompt asking for the password for the transaction data. So I'm going to use secret two, just using a different password to make a point. So we now notice that we've been given a transaction token here. And if we look at the transaction server, we now have one token over there. And all it knows about that is this person is allowed to have up to 10 accounts. It doesn't know anything else about the person. Bank accounts, yeah. At the moment, that's just meta information. Um, it's, it's used in order to define the features available to the user on the subscription, subscription plan that they're on. Um, we don't have any users yet, and we don't have any accounts. Uh, over this side here, we have a new user. Uh, we can see the profile data here is a uh, PGP, P, uh, PGP message. So that's the encrypted data. We have the public key, and we have the private key. But if we scroll down in here, like it's just gobbledygook. And remember that this data here is encrypted <laughs> using the private key, which is protected by a password that is the original password I typed in, password one. But the profile server never receives the word password one. It only receives the hashed version of that. So even with the private key on the profile server, unless you know the original password, which never gets sent to the profile server, you can't decrypt. The, the data. So if I come over here and click on create a new account, we now have, now I don't know how easy this is gonna be to tell. In fact, what I'll do is I'll copy that URL and I'll open it in a new page. So if we look over here, there's WYD, uh, WYWDT if we look at this one, this is the original. Okay, that's no different. Let's look at the end. There you go, JDPD and U88D. So the data now has changed because it's got the uh, array stored in it of the accounts that I have access to, but it still doesn't know anything about them because it's all encrypted. And meanwhile, on the transaction server, we now have uh, an account over here. Users over here are still blank because that's actually the admin users to log in and do stuff on the transaction server. Um, so we now have a situation where the accounts here are being rendered uh, by talking to the transaction server to retrieve the information. Now, because the data that's stored on the transaction server is encrypted with the private key, the, the, the public key for the transaction side of things, the one that we created with the password secret to, it means that even if somebody made a request to the transaction server given, uh, asking for information about bank account two instead of bank account one. They could technically retrieve that, but it's encrypted with a key that they don't have to decrypt it with. So Alice has the private key for account one, but she doesn't have the private key for account two. So theoretically, we can now open up the transaction server completely to the world and allow anybody to retrieve any information about any account, but only those people with the private key can decrypt it. So technically, we don't need to store the list of accounts in the profile. But of course, once you've got thousands of users and millions of accounts, you don't want to be searching every single account by a private key, because that's going to be really hard to index. So that's what I'm currently up to. Um, 
looking at this before me. There we go. That's what I'm currently after with the, with the demo. Um, it is code that's available online to look at. As I say, the things that I want to do is to create not just awareness and the start of the thought process of how we can encrypt data and still allow it to be used by software as a service systems. Now, obviously, there's questions here at the moment about, well, software as a service system isn't doing much in terms of processing that data. How do we do that? That's the next part of the, the set of questions that I have. Um, other questions that I have are sharing data anonymously between users. My current plan is to allow uh, the public key down here for the account. So this is the, the public key that's used to encrypt the data. If we store that instead as an array, then we can have multiple people having ac access to the one account. Uh, there's problems with that as well, which I'll cover in a second. <laughs> uh, and here they are. So private keys on the profile server. We are hashing the password before it goes over, and I think that's a pretty good uh, resolution to that issue. The bigger issues are processing is done on the client side, so it's only when you're active. Now, this can be done through uh, worker services, so you could potentially have I don't know, a Raspberry Pi at home that's pre-configured to run services for you. And maybe we can define a standard for uh, worker services that this system and multiple other systems could all use. If we have a standard for communicating tasks, then you could have one device that will process data for this service and for any other service that also requires offline or out of central view data processing. Um, you could also get around it by having a mobile app that's continuously processing. Don't like your chances with battery life. Uh, one of the biggest issues I'm still facing at the moment though is the network graph. So if you're familiar with um, graphs such as the, the Facebook graph API, where you've got all these nodes of information and they all interrelate. So we've got things like the transaction data up here and if I can look at transaction details and see that there's so many items in category 543 and so many items in category 264, then I can probably start making some kind of determination of, well, this category always has a roughly this much coming out every month, and it's around about the average cost of rent, so that's probably the rent category. So you can start making inferences about data. Uh, and the other part as well is if we go ahead and have this array of uh, public keys for encrypting, then I can determine that you and you are sharing an account, therefore you probably know each other. And if I take that even further, I can then create a map of who knows who by virtue of the fact that you're probably only gonna share your account information with people you trust. So you can build a trust network of anonymous and un unidentifiable people, which if you then overlay with a trust network of known identities, you could perhaps make correlations there. We live in a world where there's so much data that it's really hard to not correlate. I don't know how we solve that one yet. Um, destroy the internet, maybe. Um, so what's next? As I say, I want to uh, build a standalone data processing platform. Um, that's probably gonna be the next step to make sure that you can process the data even when you're not on the app. And one other option would be, perhaps you have trusted data processors. Uh, servers run by people that you trust to run the data processing for you and then send it back to the transaction server on your behalf so that you can then separate storage from processing. And storage can be, because it's encrypted, can be anywhere in the world, stick it on S3. Data processing, you could either run up your own server on uh, a, a cloud service that you trust or run it on your home server or get a Raspberry Pi or on your mobile phone, whichever you choose. Um, define processing rules, so going back again to um, how do we process the data, can we create rules around how that definition looks so that we can share that definition between multiple systems. Anybody in the world can use this standard format of describing the task and therefore we can all use one system to process data in an environment that you trust as an end user. Um, that's pretty much the same thing again. Um, I want to release a Raspberry Pi image to do that as well, so that if we have this standard, then we can have this off-the-shelf product, or you can get a Raspberry Pi and load the image on yourself, plug it into your network at home, and you have this thing always running, processing your data in a secure environment. 
Um, again, oftentimes this processing isn't time sensitive. If it takes five minutes for the data to come down and get uploaded again, it doesn't matter. You don't need real time data processing at this point. Um, and then perhaps at some point maybe profit. I'm not sure how that works. Um, I would love your help. I would love you to look at the code. I'd love you to play with it. I'd love you to take it and use it on your own projects. Um, it's totally open source. At the moment, it's up there as a demo because it's been written for this demo. Um, I plan to release it as a proper Laravel module of some sort uh, or, or possibly PSR compliant so you can use it on any of the, the, the frameworks. Obviously, how that manifests is unknown at the moment. Um, but I'd love to get your feedback, thoughts, contributions, if you like. Is there a question? No. Uh, so I will go to questions. I have eight minutes left, but before that, I did mention at the beginning there was a competition. So I was, I was working on this demo, and I was a bit bored at one point, so I thought I'd take a picture of my uh, array of elephants. There they are. They keep me company. And I thought, um, going back to the question before about who here knows about Signal, I thought, how can I get more people to use Signal? Because the really annoying thing with these really secure communication systems is nobody else uses them. So it's kind of pointless. Signal has a fallback. If you send a message to somebody who doesn't use Signal, it'll use the standard SMS network. But that's not ideal. So I thought, how can I get more people to do it? So what I want you all to do is, uh, actually, I don't want you to do that. I mean, you can if you like. Where's it actually on? I want you to install Signal Private Messenger. And I want you to do that and take some photos of this if you're going to enter the competition, because we're not going to do it right now, time not permitting. Um, but I want you to go to the App Store or Google Play, or if you want a link to the APK directly because you don't like Google Play or App Store, actually it's, the, it's only for Android anyway, um, they do have the APK downloadable off their website. There's a quick link there to that if you want to install it. Install Signal, and then that's the bit you actually need a photo of. Send me a secure SMS to that number. That's my personal number. Um, keep it clean, or not, I don't actually care. Um, and I will choose this afternoon at some point a random uh, message that I receive. Now it has to be through Signal. Once you install Signal, you see a tick next to the messages that were sent securely. If you send me a message and it doesn't have a tick next to it, you're not in, in the running for the, the elephant. And whoever wins gets this lovely little red PHP elephant. It's uh, Zend branded, in case that matters to you. And then maybe there are some people in the audience who are like, oh, fuck it, I'm not going to enter that competition anymore. I think I just said fuck it, didn't I? Um, so, that being said, uh, also there's Privacy Bastion stickers and badges over there if you want them taken away. Uh, so, with that being said, it says exit presentation, but I should actually say thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> well, perhaps not even questions, but thoughts, feedback, anything else? So the question was, if I switch devices, is all my data lost? The category ID is presumably created by the user. The reason for storing the encrypted transaction profile data on the profile server is so that if you, all the data is stored on the profile server. You log in, you provide a hashed version of your password to retrieve all the data you need to then access <coughs> your transactions. All the data is in that encrypted blob on the profile server. So you can log in through any device as long as you know your username and password you'll retrieve the encrypted data back, which your password then decrypts, and you have access to all your accounts again. Yeah. How, how do you handle something simple as I lost my password? How do you handle something as simple as I lost my password? <laughs> Tough luck. <laughs> but the same goes for any other encryption mechanism. You have to, uh, I mean, obviously, it's, it's harder if you require people to maintain keys. Uh, and, and again, this is one of the reasons why standard encryption, GPG, or even um, browser certificate-based authentication has been so hard to adopt because backing up keys is hard. It's something that people don't think about. Uh, by, by wrapping everything up in a container that's unlocked by a password that never leaves your device, it's harder to get it wrong. But I lost my password is irrecoverable. Create a new account. Did you have one, Jim? 
Same question. Anyone else? Yes. Changing password, good question. So to change a password, you would need to, uh, it would all happen in the browser side. So obviously the password unlocks the, uh, the blob of encrypted information that's stored on the profile server. So you already have that in memory within the browser at the time that you've logged in. So what would have to happen is that the data that would be encrypted on the profile server has to be re-encrypted. So you generate a new, new key, uh, public-private key combination using that password as the unlock passphrase, re-encrypt the data, and then update the user profile. So you'd need some kind of fallback check mechanism. Did the information actually get accepted by the profile server? Has the user object been updated? And if so, then yes, the password has changed. And then you update the in install memory of the, the password so that future decryption is going to happen as well. Um, but yes, it's not as simple as just saying change the password on the server. Um, you'd have to re-encrypt the data and then also send the hashed password to the server as the new password so it can, it can store that. Would I consider turning this into a browser extension or is that another attack vector? Um, yes, and I think it's actually, it, it stops a potential attack vector. My laptop's talking to me. Um, Existing browser extensions can already see what's happening in the DOM of your browser. So whenever you do any browser-side encryption, if it's within a standard browser environment, technically, unless you have no extensions installed or you have 100% trust in all the extensions you have installed in that browser, you can't trust my code to be the only code that sees the password that you've typed in. So you could have an extension that monitors every single input field and just sends it straight back to an external server somewhere. So by turning it into a browser extension, you could, uh, you could harden the security to a certain extent. You could potentially work out ways to only create the decrypt object in the DOM at the time that's required. Um, I'm not sure whether you could detect whether any other extensions are interfering as well though. Uh, the best way to secure it one step further would be to put it in its own sandboxed environment. So maybe you'd use one of these systems that allows you to take an existing web app and turn it into a desktop app or a mobile app, because that way you know that that browser is only operating in that environment and you can stop any other uh, extensions from interfering with it. Anyone else? Are there any books about this subject? Not to my knowledge, but maybe I'll write one. <laughs> I mean, obviously, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of books out there already on how encryption works, GPG encryption. Um, there's blogs out there on best practices. Um, uh, Bruce Schneier, for example, if you follow his blog, he talks a lot about uh, GPG encryption and all sorts of security encryption processes. Um, talking about this particular way of implementing uh, browser-side encryption in order to encrypt data directly to the server, I'm not aware of any book. Are there any banks that have an API like this? There's a bank in South Africa called Root, root.co.za. I actually saw one yesterday. I believe there might be one in the back of the room somewhere. I saw him earlier. He's buggered off. Um, it's fantastic. So they have an open API. Uh, you can do things like disable your card. Um, one of the projects that this friend of mine is planning on doing is having an app that allows you to unlock the card for use in a certain area for a certain time. So you can actually increase the security of your own card through the API the bank provides. Unfortunately, they're the only one in the world at the moment, and uh, I very much doubt that other banks are going to follow suit quickly, unfortunately. How about the Bank of the Enter? There's a bank, uh, Boom, in the Netherlands, and they also start providing the, those API, and you can already fetch uh, transaction devices that are expanding it. Wh what was the name of that bank? Boom. Boom. Yeah. All right. Just for the recording. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Every bank is required by 2018 to have such an API. That's fantastic news. Is that a European yeah, initiative? European, uh, regulations Sucks to be me. It takes ages for things to get to Australia. <laughs> 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 I realize that I'm eating into your lunch break, figuratively. Um, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to take them. But if you want to head off to lunch, that's fine too. Thank you.